hello and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak to you here. Uh, just a clarification, I noticed the FBI was on the uh, on the announcement and I'm not with the FBI, I don't represent them in any way. I'm a private citizen, uh, I work with them through a partnership and that's what I'm going to talk about with InfraGuard. And I'll explain a little bit about what InfraGuard does and perhaps may somewhere where you might want to get involved in a little bit further. Uh, I certainly encourage, like what our uh, announcer here uh, was talking about, uh, educational opportunities and exposure. The, you, the younger you can do that, the better you are, and I think it really prepares you for a career. So InfraGuard, the InfraGuard program, uh, protecting our critical infrastructure. A little bit about myself, I have a background in software development, network design, uh, information technology, security, cybersecurity, and digital forensics. I've done this uh, uh, professionally. I've done this for a private company. I've also been involved in, uh, with other companies, ISC Squared, I have a certification through them as well. I uh, have a bachelor's in mathematics uh, with a minor in computer science and a master's in computer science. I've been in telecommunications specifically about 15 years now uh, with a company known as VTX1. You may have heard of them. Uh, they're a regional company. South Texas, who provide uh, telecommunication services in different facets, uh, fiber optic, wireless, and the like. Uh, essentially, my responsibilities include uh, their information technology department, the information security department, uh, wireless network, IP core network, and physical security services. So what is InfraGuard? Well, InfraGuard itself, is, it's a partnership between the FBI and public and private sector. What that means is it's, a, it's an organization whose goal, whose mission, is information sharing. Now, some of you, I mean, just by show of hands, who, who's heard of InfraGuard before? Before I start talking about them, okay. A few of you, most of you haven't, good. Maybe I can uh, form a, a, a good uh, opinion about them. Some of you may have formed opinions already. It's been in the news before. There have been some negative press, there have been some positive press, but overall the goal, the mission of InfraGuard and what it stands for, what, it, what the purpose is, is a good one. And I hope to, to describe that a little bit further for you. Uh, who are the members of InfraGuard? Really it varies. There are business executives, there are students, there are professionals, uh, there are people in education, there are people in the medical sector. It, it covers a wide range of, of folks who are interested in protecting national, uh, critical infrastructure, essentially. Uh, the infrastructure that keeps us running as a nation. Uh, we, as InfraGuard, encourage the information sharing between these sectors because it's, it's, it's been uh, realized that by information sharing, the activities, the, the nose on the ground people, the people who know what's going on, aren't always the FBI. The private sector has a lot of good information. And the more that information can be shared and can be can be given, can be provided across sectors even, not even just to, to the FBI, but even between sectors, the better off we all are at detecting and eliminating threats for infrastructure. So what's the structure? Uh, there's this uh, group called the uh, Public-Private Alliance Unit within the FBI, specifically the Strategic Outreach Initiatives Section or Cyber Division. Uh, nationally, we have about 33,000 members. It may be a little bit more than that now. Uh, that was from about 2012, I believe. Uh, within Texas, we are one of six, what are called IMAs or chapters. Uh, there's the uh, El Paso, North Texas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, and now Rio Grande Valley. Uh, Rio Grande Valley actually began in the San Antonio lands. Uh, we've, we've slowly developed and grown to our own chapter here. Uh, essentially, uh, the way it's organized is each one of our IMAs or chapters has a, a in regard special coordinator, special agent, who works with us, who kind of helps coordinate our meetings and, and get together and, and help us to uh, outreach to the community and get <coughs> to the A little bit of the history, uh, for those of you who haven't heard of InfraGuard, it was formed in 96 in the Cleveland field office. And the idea originally was to get information from information uh, technology or cyber um, technology areas into the FBI. They realized, the FBI field office realized, hey, we don't have all the information, we can't have agents everywhere. It's better to start looking at the private sector to try to give us more information. We need to, to know what's going on. Uh, basically, it took off after that from 96 to 98. It expanded across the entire state of, of Ohio. And from there, uh, was pulled into FBI headquarters and expanded to 
the rest of the 56 field offices. Primarily, up until 2001, InfraGuard was focused on information technology and security. That was its main mission. It's seeing the evolving threat in those fields, InfraGuard focused on evolving their interaction with professionals in that field. We all know what happened in September of 2011. From September 2001, sorry, September 11, 2001, from that day forward, InfraGuard mission expanded. It was no longer just gaining cybersecurity information or information technology uh, professionals. It was across all sectors, all critical infrastructure sectors. Realizing that we didn't have all the information, they expanded to physical sectors, and I'll talk about which ones those are here in a minute. Since 2003, uh, we formed a new alliance called the InfraGuard National Members Alliance. This basically helped us to form ourselves better so that each of the independent IMAs that have sprung up have a, a national organization, basically, a voice to, to speak from. Uh, each of us, the IMAs, is, is a 501c3 corporate entity. So we have a board, we have, uh, we're, we're a nonprofit in status. What are the InfraGuard mission and goals? Essentially, Information sharing, as I mentioned, to reduce security threats and vulnerabilities to critical infrastructures. I'll talk about the different sectors here in a second. To develop and support a partnership with InfraGuard members and the FBI to support all FBI investigative programs. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, Director Comey speak not too long ago. Uh, he was here visiting the Valley earlier this year, and then again he was in uh, D.C. just before the folks visit. But he, he gave a few very directed, uh, very good points about what InfraGuard's mission is. InfraGuard, because of that expanded effort in all of the critical sectors to, to involve itself and to involve the communities, involve cross sectors uh, with what, what do you see? In other words, if you are in the information technology sector, if you run a business and you notice some activity, some behavior that's erratic, you can, through this process, share it with other chapters or with the FBI and other agencies. I think his, his direct statement was InfraGuard was, if not the biggest source, one of the bigger sources of information that the FBI used to help combat known threats. And in fact, we got into a, he got into a little bit more specific detail of what those threats were. Most of us only hear about the threats that cause harm. We never hear about the ones that were avoided. There's a significant number that never became anything serious because of programs like InfraGuard sharing with the FBI. It doesn't just stay, it doesn't stay with the FBI. Uh, the INMA is actually is an independent organization. We have MOUs and mem uh, memorandums of understanding with the FBI, DHS, ATF, and BDMS. So the goal is two-way information flow. We don't, uh, if you, like I said, if, if you had heard of InfraGuard, most people think it's citizens handing information over to the FBI. What good is is there in it for us. But it really, we, it's both ways. The FBI shares some sensitive information, not classified, it's unclassified, but sensitive information about what they notice the threats are. What are the activities that need to be addressed? What is uh, one other chapter or another region, another sector noticing? What are those types of activities? That information is available in our meetings and we're able to hopefully from understanding what those threats are, make better decisions ourselves within our, our region. The goal, again, protecting critical infrastructures. Why not make it an FBI program? Why is it, in, why is it separate? Uh, well, the FBI, the FBI provides us a strength in that, obviously, they have a history of investigations. They are the ones who can do something about what the threats are. We, as private citizens, may notice what the threats are, but we can't go further than that. The FBI can't. What they do for InfraGuard is they provide vetting. They provide a secure infrastructure for us to communicate. They provide law enforcement sensitive products. They conduct investigations. They take action on what InfraGuard produces. What does InfraGuard do? Well, we're self-governed. Uh, we have subject matter, matter experts across industry, across sectors. We provide non-government intelligence. Uh, Government intelligence is sometimes difficult between agencies, but InfraGuard avoids all of that. Uh, we can help with other agencies, as I mentioned, MOUs and DHS and others uh, can help facilitate that conversation better. 
We can also do marketing, we can do fundraising as a nonprofit, and we have a mission to educate. We have a mission uh, within our membership to find ways that we can educate the public. For example, October is Cybersecurity Cybersecurity Awareness Month. That's something we take very seriously. What is the biggest threat to national security? It's not necessarily a cyber terrorist, although those do exist. Many times it's very simple, uh, simple activities by people who don't know any better. So educating the public is a strong component of what InfraGuard is, is about. Uh, what are national critical infrastructures? The best way to describe it is <coughs> Bill Clinton's description here. Basically, physical and cyber-based systems that are essential for the minimum operations of the eco economy and government. If these, these systems are so vital that if they were gone, it would have a debilitating impact. There is no other better way to say it. If, if somebody attacks the national uh, electric grid, if somebody attacks the communication systems, if they actually uh, take them out of service, it means a, seri it means a serious uh, act has happened. We saw with September uh, 11, 2001, that type of activity happened. When, when communications were down, People were unavailable, to, unavailable, could not be reached. Uh, it was a serious enough threat that caused national panic. And activities like that have been planned and have been, uh, have been constructed other times than that one time that the plan succeeded and have been thwarted because of information sharing programs like we have. Can I ask a question here? <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. So, uh, I think I understand what you guys are doing, uh, that it involves kind of cyber terrorism, but other forms of, of uh, national threats also. Uh, so of course, being down here on the border, um, you know, uh, if somebody blew up one of our international bridges, uh, that would be a horrendous thing. Uh, so there's an obvious need to share information with uh, uh, people in Mexico. Does that happen uh, at all or, or much? Or, or not, not through this program, through and I'll program. explain what, yeah, this, this specific program is, uh, there are some membership requirements. Uh, with, we could not have an InfraGuard Mexico, but maybe through another affiliated organization through the FBI. It's not something that I, I could speak to for this program. Okay. Yeah, so this program doesn't have that. These are the national critical infrastructure, in case, in case you were wondering. Basically, agriculture, food, banking, finance, chemical, uh, commercial facilities, communications, manufacturing, dams, or water, waterways, defense industrial bases, emergency services, energy, government, healthcare, information technology, monuments, reactors, postal shipping, transportation, and water. These are the identified uh, critical infrastructures. And we have within the, I'll speak a little bit about the Rio Grande Valley chapter here in a second. Uh, we have representation across sectors. Not every sector is represented. That's something that is one of our primary missions as a an official chapter, I'll talk about that in a second. So how is information shared? I mean, as most entities, especially national, international organizations, we have a, a website, we use that to communicate with one another, and it's secured through uh, the FBI uh, program. Uh, we get Department of Homeland Security threat alerts, warnings, vulnerabilities. Uh, there, is, there are intelligence bulletins that we routinely receive through this, through this portal. Uh, there's a message board, email, mailing list, and Again, the local agent assigned to at us as FBI coordinator for InfraGuard uh, brings also themselves news and information that they're able to, to share. Regions, uh, essentially there's five regions, it used to be six. Uh, the west region all became one. It used to be north, west, and southwest. The Pacific was separate. Now it's all just the west region. We also have special interest groups. Uh, Specifically, here's, here's a few of them. This is not the full list. Uh, food, agriculture, chemical, and research technology. Uh, there's another really big one uh, that I noticed at, at the annual Congress, which is the uh, EMP special interest group. Now it's grown pretty significant. Not EMP as far as weaponized uh, EMP, but natural EMP, solar flares and activities. It's a really big uh, number. Our membership structure, uh, Basically, we're independent. Each of our IMAs is independent. We have a board. I serve as vice president of the Rio Grande Valley uh, Alliance, and we report to the national members of this. Requirements, US citizen. Uh, you have to be able to pass an FBI background check. You have to consent to a criminal background 
check and recertification. You have to be willing to notify the FBI of pending cr criminal and civil matters. They'll be discovered whether or not you notify them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to sign and adhere to a confidentiality and non-disclosure. Uh, we have a website, infraguard.net. You click on become a member and fill out the application. If you do decide to do that, please fill one out. Why should, that's, that's kind of the point I wanted to get to. Why should you share information? This is not just with the FBI, but this is with your peers within the sector. This is national. If you are a, an information technology uh, person, specialist, developer, if, if you are a person who has care and, uh, and would like to know what's going on within your nation and have the information you need to make better decisions, if you feel that that's important to you, and you want to be involved, then by all means, become part of InfraGuard and share that information. It is critical. It may not be something you think is very important, but as, as was pointed out, with our proximity to the border, there may be activities unique to our area that only citizens within our area would be a, a, aware of. We don't have enough agents to have a person in every sector. There's no way to count. But if an activity could be thwarted because you were available and you were participating, it, it would make a big difference. The Rio Grande Valley and Frigard Members Alliance, uh, as I mentioned, was part of San Antonio up until this year. Uh, I attended the National uh, Congress on September 21st and became our own chapter. So we were excited about that. We've been holding meetings unofficially for about a year or so, uh, only because San Antonio was such a far away distance. We have about 60 members or so now. Uh, we have once a month meetings at the UTRGD CPSS building, Bill Hagar building. Uh, it's been working out really well. Uh, we're seeking new members across sectors. I think we only have about three or four currently represented. We'd like to get more of those, those 16 sectors. And we have activities planned. I mentioned a little bit, let me just talk to this really quickly. We have activities planned to help foster education. What I mean by this is not purely within InfraGuard. As I mentioned before, the members of InfraGuard are subject matter experts. They're people who work in the field. They're people who are educators or business professionals or work in banks or have other expertise. Each of these people have an audience that they can reach. They have an audience that they can speak to. They have the ability and a platform to, to discuss InfraGuard and what it does. We have, through that, uh, through that uh, arrangement, been able to reach out to the community through other groups. For example, uh, I'm also a CISSP. I'm a member of ISC School. There's a program there called Safe and Secure Online which is a kids program through Child Night International to teach about cybersecurity threats. October was a perfect month for that. I think we did about four or five presentations this month at different schools and, and try to reach out and make sure that as much as we could, we provided the information critical to keep kids and parents aware of what the threats are to them in the cybersecurity landscape. That's just one of the areas we have several others in several other sectors that I can talk about more if you're interested. And I think that's my time. So is there any questions? Regarding code of ethics, I mean, you, you guys, the program, you have a lot of information. You have access to a lot of information. And if that information trade that happened with the FBI and many other private agencies as well, um, what it, what it looks like, your code of ethics? Um, as far as what what are we willing to share? You mean? Yeah. Or whether or not we keep that. Well, there, we have a non-disclosure agreement. We do have a code of ethics. I can I can bring it up for you what it is. But essentially, it's, <coughs> it's not share everything. It's share. See something, say something. Share what you think might be critical. If it if it doesn't seem right, if there's something wrong about the information, if it doesn't smell right, say something to somebody. Because if you don't say something and it really is a problem. Who else is going to? So, like I said, we're kind of like the eyes and ears. We're closer to where a problem may be happening and not even know it. You don't have to go and tell them. Everybody say, well, so-and-so is doing this and so-and-so is doing that. That's not necessarily what's promoted. But if you notice something that's out of the ordinary, you should say something about it. And that, that's really what it is. Are most of the members of your organization uh, IT people, or is it just kind of, you know, every department in yeah, surprisingly, the the, uh, the sectors represented, the biggest sector is banking. Banking and finance. We have a, a big number in, in that group. But yeah, 
Besides that, IT and, and, and security group, I, information security uh, professionals. You know, we have several of them from here and from like STC and other other areas around the region. Yeah, but mostly, I've heard it in the banking you know world where you know they try to find you know like a, something in the um, the example I've, I I saw was that in regard to in, in involved in a um, credit card point of uh, point of sale system trying to identify the virus or the, or the algorithm that was inside there and trying to steal the credit card information. That was the, the share, I guess. Was, was we do have that, especially within banking. We know or have maybe we've seen or heard about uh, skimmers, ATM skimmers, and other other types of, of hacking tools basically attached to machines. A lot of that information does come through the banking sector. They're, they report that kind of activity. And when you see the same uh, attempted method in one place, and you see it in another place, you can make predictions about where that, that behavior, where that, that activity is moving through a region. And it has happened before. Actually, that was a specific case that happened not very long ago. And because we have so many banking professionals represented in InfraGuard today, it was really easy to, to share that information. You can see them all discussing you know, just how that would impact them. They all noticed whether or not it was impacting them. Already. So, yeah, sure. Has there been a lot of um activity as far as uh, banks catching people wiring money to the Middle East or other places with questionable things. Is that what they're looking for? I mean, are they looking for like money laundering or I mean I mean what kind of things are originally it would seem it would seem like and I can't speak to the FBI uh, but I can tell you my own opinion based on what I know from Infraguard. But it would seem like some of those activities fall outside the scope of somebody like Infraguard. We're not really protecting infrastructure. It's okay. money, right? It's money laundering. However, when those activities relate to something that, let's say, a payment for something that could be a cyber terrorism uh, event that's being plotted, then it can be. Made. So those activities are important. They're crucial. Even if it's not a direct attack on banking, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of information, knowing when that happens and how frequently, can help for other areas of investigation. So really, it's across the board. So, so some of the members of InfraGuard will go ahead and relay that back to the FBI just because you if, don't know what it, how, like if you were the saying. Information, mm -hmm. If the information is, is erroneous, it's an outlier, then there's a reason to investigate it further. And that's really the, the extent of what, what kind of information sharing happens is there's something not completely right here. And if it doesn't look completely right, maybe there's something else going on. If you, if you sense that, you should say something. And many times that ends up being the case. It's some other activity that's not related to what the one you know the, um, there was a recent uh, problem with Target where their credit card machines were, I guess, hacked, I guess, or it was vulnerable, or what was the exact details? But uh, <clears throat> the main thing that I wanted to ask is, is that an InfraGuard related activity where Target would say, FBI, this is what happened, or I guess I, uh, I need more help on the definition of cyber terrorism because when I hear that Target got, got you know vulnerable and all their uh, credit card access and everything, that seems like a really big deal to me as as a consumer and you know my my identity, my credit cards, all that is to me an infrastructure problem. But I don't know. Could you bear, could you perhaps elaborate whether that situation was somehow in, in that particular situation? I don't believe that Target was involved. I might be wrong. There are activities outside of what InfraGuard does that the FBI investigates. I believe in that case it was a bad policy. Uh, they allowed some third party to connect to a, a sensitive system, in this case I think the HVAC company, to connect and control some remote system, and that's the, the flaw that somebody was used to, used to exploit their credit card machines. Now they had access to the network through a back door. So it was just bad policy, some IT policy. Somebody made it figure it out. And, and that's actually my follow-up question is that when you guys get together in your, meet, in your meetings, um, do you get to learn about other cases around, around the world or around the country where you can say uh, your members become more informed and more educated of better policy makings, better things to do? And Definitely. It is one of our goals. Education, I only mentioned outreach to the community, but education within our sector is a big goal. We frequently bring in agents and analysts from other agencies, too to present on a specific topic, for example, cybersecurity, or active shooter threats, or anything, basically. Anything that can be a threat to security, especially to 
Like for example, we're at, we're at a campus today. An active shooter threat may be a really a real uh, problem. It's something that you want to be aware of, how to, how to realize what's happening and what steps to take. Well, there are people who represent educational uh, entities who attend our, our Infobard meetings who may have an interest in that. So we, we vary topics across as many sectors as we can. And it's not just local uh, presenters, it's presenters we can bring from Washington, D.C., presenters we can bring from other agencies. It just depends on the topic. And it's, what, it's led by our members, so our members decide what, you know, what those topics are. So whatever the interest is. Yes, uh, I just wanted to ask, from what I gathered, the idea of InfraGuard is almost like a surveillance and report process. I was just wondering what sort of authority InfraGuard would have to take action against some sort of potential threat. And if there isn't direct action, how long would it usually take to stop a potential threat or to stop an action in progress? That's something I can't speak to. Uh, InfraGuard itself uh, does not directly respond to threats. We provide information, and the FBI are the ones who respond to those threats. Many times, though, if it's a complicated situation, InfraGuard may be used for information, additional information, uh, ongoing investigation, what other, what other activities you may have noticed or what other uh, people may have been involved. But as far as the investigation and response goes, that's something that we are doing. Just imagine the whole, whole complex and maybe it's here for it. Per year, how many, how many uh, threats do you identify or have, do you have to identify? Do you have a number, something like that? You know, I wish I, I, wish I did have. Uh, Director Comey actually na named a few numbers in his presentation. Uh, it was a significant number, but I couldn't say. I want to say it's in the hundreds or more uh, per year. But if you're interested, I can find out for sure. It's something that they keep uh, they keep track of you know, a little bit more tightly to see. Because the problem is, when most people hear the FBI, they only ever hear about the negative cases. They're doing something wrong. Well, guess what? They're made up of people. People can can have problems, and just like any organization or group, that those kind of people may work there. But they do a lot of good. Also, and the good is never really focused on. It. I think they're starting to do a little bit better job of, of demonstrating what that is and, and keeping the statistics available. If you're interested, I can find out what it is. It's a significant number. It's way more than the actual threats. I was wondering because anyway, you said 100, and 100 seems like a really small number of threats that may be made well, by the. Uh, it, say, say it's 100 for every one that maybe causes an issue. 100 to one is significant. If it's really in the thousands, maybe um, 10 actually cause, or, or not necessarily have a, a critical impact, but go beyond just the planning stage. But I, I couldn't really tell you the numbers. I'd have to find out what they are. But it's a significant number. I remember hearing it, and it was, it was a significant number. Um, so there's been a lot of cases recently where there's mass shootings and people that are going to take action on these uh, shootings. They posted it on. Well, uh, the best thing we can do is get more members. I mean, if, if, it, if a student notices something like that, and the student is a friend or a friend of a friend who happens to come across that, it, it's, you should never assume that somebody else is going to take care of it. That's kind of like the, the bystander effect. You think, oh, well, somebody else will help them, or somebody else will notice this. And, and, obviously, and there's way too many devices, too many people, too many networks to monitor them all very closely. Usually, it's it's targeted at uh, very high level threats. Very small ones may not be noticed until it's further along, and then it comes on the radar. Or so, having active members and communities who are students even is a good thing. We want to have that exposure. We want to be able to to have people in all those groups who, if you see something like that, can tell the FBI. That Are there any more questions? Right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.